Would you be interested in discovering the fastest way to place yourself in self-hypnosis? In order that you can release the rest of you, the true potential which is inside of you, free that so that you can solve your own problems, kind of work out the conundrums, the conflicts of life that are, that are kind of holding you back. Discover the fixed ideas that are anchoring you to where you are when you're wanting to be solving something else, okay? If, if that makes sense, then that's what this video is about. So I'm going to show you uh, a technique that personally I use quite frequently as a really super quick way to place myself in self-hypnosis. And I'm sorry I have to do this with a, a microphone in front of me and a, and a green screen behind me, but it, it's still cold outside and uh, and it's important to kind of keep on expressing these things. So, uh, so yeah, so, so green screen it is, I'm afraid. And I've decided I don't really like putting some nonsensical background in the replace of the green screen. I just leave the green screen. So I hope that's okay. <laughs> um, right, so well, let's start with why, why would you bother? Why would you care? What's the point? What, what is self-hypnosis anyway? What is hypnosis even? Um, so, for me, placing yourself in self-hypnosis is a ritual to permit the chattering part of your mind to just shut up a bit, to just go quieter. Not to get rid of it completely, but to just quieten it down so that you can discover the rest of you, so that you can permit the information superhighway to the vast supercomputer that is so much bigger than your conceptual ego and, and, and ask that for advice. So, so for me, self-hypnosis, and I accept that this is just a metaphor in my mind, but it's a useful metaphor in my mind, is to bring a sense of questioning, of intention, to access the vast creative expanse of the rest of you and bring that massive resource to something that you choose to resolve. So, so for me, self-hypnosis, as opposed to meditation, for example, is a very, very effective tool for solving something. So you come with an intention. You come with a particular issue in mind that you want the assistance of the rest of you to illuminate. So you can come up with different options, more options, better options. Yeah. You do that through a ceremony. And the amusing thing is that anything can be a ceremony if you choose it to be, right? The, 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 the easiest one is you go and you buy yourself a ticket for the cinema, you arrive at the cinema, you smell the popcorn and the hot dogs and you see the people, you go down the corridor, you see all of the seats, you sink down into a big, deep chair and the massive screen is in front of you. You are there, right? You are already in a state of self-hypnosis. You're basically saying, OK, I will shut off my uh, critical, judgmental part of me. Tell me a story and I will pretend that it's true. It's a ceremony. But anything can be a ceremony. Okay, so before we go any further, right? Let's do the uh, the health warning. Okay, because I'm going to go through an example of a really really quick way to place yourself in self hypnosis. Please do not, under any circumstances, listen to this or watch it on a video when you are driving, when you are operating machinery. Only watch when it's absolutely safe and appropriate to do so, especially if you're unfamiliar with with what's going on, because you, you want to be in a place that's that's kind of in your control. So what I would suggest is that you actually find a place where you won't be disturbed for a while, where you can give it your full attention, whatever that means. And, uh, and then we'll go through it. Okay. So yeah, so let's, let's start with this idea of, of 
why you would do it and how the ceremony leads you there. Now, we know that we learn things and habituate those things to the point where we almost don't know we've learned them anymore. They just become automatic habits. You know, driving a car is the easiest example. You, you When you learn it, it's really hard. It's really tricky. There are a thousand and ones to think about. There's the machinery of the car. There's the lights. There's the buttons, the levers. There's the position of your feet, the position of your hands. There's looking in the mirror. There's seeing whatever is out there. There are reading the signs, observing the people, observing the other cars. A thousand and one things. But the more you learn it, the more comfortable with all of that you become, the more automatic it becomes until you kind of don't know you're doing it anymore. You get in the car, you set off, you do the whole thing on autopilot, you arrive at the other end and you wonder what you were doing in the meantime. You know, almost daydreaming. Or maybe you want to think about something like um, your painting maybe, or writing, or listening to music, or just sitting out looking at the countryside, and your mind goes calm, and you feel like you, and you're doing what you cannot not do. You just fall into that process, that feeling, because it's familiar, because it's been habituated, because you know in that circumstance there a trigger allows you to change into a different state, if you want to call it a state. Yeah? So what I'm talking about here is creating a trigger like that, that you can practice, that you can habituate, so that you've got the ability to just place yourself in self-hypnosis, basically at will. Yeah? And this is super quick, so you can do it however you wish. So that's that's an explanation of, of how. Let's do a quick one on why. So uh, conceptually, let's say, normally our reality is painted by the stories running in our mind. The mental chatter, which is labelling the things that it notices. Yeah. So most of the stuff that is bombarding us all of the time, the things going on, we kind of filter out. A few of them we notice, a few of them th we feel as though we thought ourselves, but actually these thoughts just kind of bubbled up and then we notice them and took credit for them. But there are, at the end of that, a series of thoughts which are running around inside of our head at any given moment. And most of the time the thoughts come and go. Certain thoughts recur or ruminate or or come up at certain times of the day because there is a trigger attached to them. But whatever, there is this mental chatter which gets in the way of you being able to access the, the rest, this enormous, extraordinary brain capacity, which is doing so many things completely outside of our conscious awareness to keep all of this working, to regulate. So the act of self-hypnosis, the act of permitting yourself by choice to follow this ceremony allows that mental chatter to calm, to quieten down. It doesn't disappear completely. You are always aware of the one who is aware, okay? You're always observing the observer, let's say. But you do so from a position of kind of talking to your critical mind, your judgmental mental chatter, L like a young child that, that kind of needs a little tap on the head. It's like, it's all right, but just for this moment, could you just be quiet? Can you just kind of sit there and let me have a chat with the rest of me? Is that sort of an idea? The end result is, well, actually the end result is whatever the end result is, because your experience of that is going to be different to my experience of that. And, and they're both correct or incorrect. 
they're both just examples. The way that one accesses whatever you want to call it, the organism, the rest of your brain, the vast supercomputer, is by expanding your awareness of what is there. And in order to do that, the limiting part of you, the conceptualizing part of you, the objectifying part of you, the chattering part of you, has to stop boxing in your definition of reality. Because if you're using self-hypnosis to solve a conundrum, to solve a conflict, a problem, well, you're inside the problem. You're inside the story. You're inside the fixed ideas which are maintaining you in the, conund in the conundrum, in the conflict. So what we're saying is that is a mental construct. That is a story that is imprisoning me in its apparent reality. And by placing yourself in self-hypnosis, you will permit yourself to park that story with your uh, chattering mind kind of in the passenger seat of the car. Yeah, so it's just here. It's not gone away completely. It, 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 it still exists. It's still aware. It's still observing. But it is permitting you for a moment to just see that story from the side and consider that it might only be a story and that there might be alternatives. And what does the rest of you think? So it's an act of trusting yourself, of handing over to the rest of you, a little bit like when you go to sleep. You don't push yourself into sleep. You permit sleep to occur. And, and then you get wild dreams, right? Like you don't choose the dreams. And sometimes you can get real moments of revelation from dreams. So if you might imagine self-hypnosis as a sort of a similar process of permitting it to occur, of not grabbing it and, and, and dragging it inside of you, but simply allowing that to occur, but going there with a question in mind, going there with an intention. And the best thing is if you can go with a question that I call a, a toward question, which is an NLP term. But that the idea is, imagine that you had a question that the positive response you would want to run towards, rather than the explanation that you would rather run away from, you know. So an away question would be, uh, why am I so stupid, right? Why do I keep on thinking in this way? Because the explanation is going to teach you even better how to maintain your problem. A toward question is, all right, so this, is, this here is my problem, my conflict that I want to resolve. What is the thing that I would notice when I've resolved it. And then the question becomes not problem related, but solution related. How do I get there? What do I need to do in order to feel the result? What do I need to do? Can I receive support from whichever part of me knows something useful in order to obtain my objective, not why do I keep doing X, Y, Z? Yeah, so I hope that's sort of an explanation. So you want to come with an intention of a question which is going to lead you towards the way that you want to go. Now, there is a sort of an oxymoron here, okay? So the reason why I am a hypnotherapist is that there are certain things that you can do in self-hypnosis and certain things that you can't, right? Because well, I hope you can understand that in order to place yourself in hypnosis, you are quietening the conscious part of your mind, you're quietening the chatter. But in order to bring the intention and to ask the question, somehow or other you have to reinstate that 
conscious part of you to to exercise the choice but then simultaneously kind of quieten it down again yeah so there is a limit to what you can do in self-hypnosis and sometimes it's useful that you have someone else as a guide to work you through those processes or it might be that the question is is so big so challenging that even through the idea of quietening your mind the habituated responses the embodied responses are similar they are so deeply wedded that that self-hypnosis is not sufficient and then you might want to go to someone else okay but that's not to say that you can't do a lot with self-hypnosis you can do a fantastic amount with self-hypnosis you can also rehabituate yourself you can find new uh, ways to create skills inside of yourself that, that didn't exist. You can find ways of simply releasing your creativity by quietening yourself, by allowing yourself a sense of focus that you can't get with your chattering mind. So there's a lot going on that it's useful for. So you come with that sense of intention. You place yourself by the method that I'm going to show you into self-hypnosis then you kind of remind yourself by scratching a little bit on that on that part of you what was it that i was here for you bring that up and then you go all right i've got it now just go quiet again and then you just ask advice you ask yourself and see what bubbles up and and maybe imagining it is a little bit like a sort of a lucid dream might be a way of uh of establishing a method of communication with that uh, it's going to be different. You know, some people are are quite uh, visual. They might see pictures inside of themselves. Some people are able to objectify their issues and put them out in front and establish communication. Some people just imagine it. They're going to get a felt sense of it. So whatever feels right is okay. And then when you're ready, absurd though it might sound, you just choose to come back. I know people sometimes get a bit scared that, well, what if I get stuck? You know, what if I get stuck in hypnosis? I, I, there's never been a case where anyone has been stuck in hypnosis. But you, we're not even sure what the state of hypnosis actually is. But it is certainly a choice. And if you need proof, just imagine that you're in the deepest, deepest state of, of hypnosis. And then I ask you to give me the pin number on your credit card. You'd open your eyes. You'd look at me with a sense of absolute anger. How dare you? Or something like that, right? Or you're in a beautiful state of self-hypnosis and the fire alarm goes off. You would open your eyes and run out the door, right? So, so this conscious part of your mind has never gone completely. So you choose to bring yourself back out of self-hypnosis you just feel as though you've had the most extraordinary um moment of self-care and then you open your eyes you know sometimes it can bring a flood of tears there's so much emotion attached to it but it's a very beautiful experience but it's under your control you have a sense of choice okay so the whole thing is uh, ceremony driven you are exercising your personal sense of choice to place yourself in a different state that you get better at the more you practice that allows you to access the parts of you that you don't normally do just like Carling Black Label and then you end up coming out with a whole series of conclusions that you weren't aware of before you open your eyes and you go ah that's the process yeah okay the ceremony and as I said, everything is a ceremony. Anything can be a ceremony. The only thing you have to do is decide that that is a ceremony. So, you know, sleep is a ceremony if you attach significance to sleep or a, a tap on the forehead. One that I actually like very much is, is um, and this is not the one I'm going to show you, but this is the one I'm going to show you before I show you the one I'm going to show you. So you simply... Um, Using your breath, you, you take in a good deep breath, hold the breath, and let the breath go. And you're kind of making the out breath twice as long as the in breath. Second good deep breath. Hold the breath. And let the breath go very, very slow. By the second breath, you can already feel that sense of stillness coming inside of yourself. Still 
actually breathing out. Third deep breath in. Hold the breath. And let that breath go. And at that point, if your eyes are open, you can close your eyes. And there's a whole lot of paraphernalia that you can go through at that point. But just simply observe the stillness of your body. Notice how with each of those breaths, you are able to lengthen the out breath. Maybe attach some sort of story or significance to the fact that you're breathing in peace. And you're breathing out any tension. Noticing whatever is around you, noticing the chair or the bed that you're sitting on. Becoming aware of your body. Noticing your heart rate, your pulse. Stilling your body through whatever feels right to you. Through a sort of an observational curiosity of what is alive in you at that moment. And then when you notice that your body is still and calm. And you simply want to invite your mind to join that experience and calm itself down. The only thing you do is you bring your attention to the space between your eyes. To the calm between your eyes. To the stillness between your eyes. Allowing with your kind of peripheral attention, observation to notice your breathing. Allowing your breathing to be deeply rested and slow. If your mind needs to focus on anything at all, allow it to focus on that space between your eyes. And if you can hear your breath, maybe even quieten your breath so it's so gentle that you can barely hear it at all. And you're in a state of complete stillness, body still, mind quiet. And that was pretty quick. And I promise you, every time you practice this, you get better at it. So that very soon, even the act of taking the three deep breaths in, it's already kind of a, a trigger. It's like, oh, we're doing this again. And you, you, you're already leading yourself there. You might want to imagine when you find that stillness in your brain, a favorite color just kind of spreading across your mind so that your mind is totally filled with peace. I don't know, whatever. It's your choice. It's your story. It's your trigger. So whatever feels right is is right for you. So that's one way of doing it. OK. And then once you've reached that point, then you kind of go, now, why was I here? Ask for the, the intention, the question. And then it's like, all right. And then with utter open-hearted curiosity everything is potential everything is okay what do you think Let's see what comes up if um if you want to sometimes what i do is i actually use my phone and i uh, start the voice memo recording and i just do verbal diarrhea okay i just speak whatever it is that bubbles up and I just talk so that I can listen to it later uh, on the on the phone 
I'm not sure if that's absolutely necessary because I think the the value in this process is in letting go and in permitting the rest to occur. And what is useful kind of embeds. Um, but you might find it useful to then, you know, listen afterwards and review. So that's one way of doing it. But, but now let me show you the even quicker one. <laughs> And this, if you want, you can do this in a matter of five seconds. This is wild. I will show it to you slowly because it's important, right? You want to get the steps right. But once you understand that it is a ceremony that is triggering you to go where you choose to go, you can make it quicker and quicker and quicker until it's just like that. So this is... Um, uh this is something uh, uh it actually came let me give you a bit of credit so this came from a book by rick barrett um which is called uh, tai chi kwan through the western gate and he doesn't talk about it as a hypnotic induction he talks about this as a meditative process but i find that with one extra step you can turn this fantastically into a self-hypnosis method. So, um, so these two index fingers on each hand, I want you to place pointing forwards, but not, you know, I'm, I'm raising them up so that you can see it on the screen. You want to do this so that they're just, your hands are comfortable just hovering above your lap. You know, so maybe, I don't know, 10 second, ten centimeters above your lap. Your hands are kind of just hovering. <laughs> when you when you kind of allow them to hover above your your lap, you might even notice a sort of a sense of energy between, almost like a sort of a magnetic pull or a magnetic push between your your palms and and your your legs. And, you know, maybe you can even find a sort of a, a point there where they are comfortable hovering, almost as if there's sort of an invisible balloon supporting them at that point. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but I, that's what I'm feeling when I do this. But anyway, what you're doing then, and you don't need any effort in this, so it doesn't really matter where the other hands are. But what I want you to do is to focus on the two index fingers, the two first fingers on these hands, which are about that far apart okay about sort of 10 centimeters apart so they're there about 10 centimeters 10 centimeters above your legs and they're about 10 centimeters 15 centimeters apart and i don't know where the other fingers of your hand are maybe they're also kind of outstretched or maybe they're relaxed down a bit and where your thumb is maybe you can even notice the air around your hand you can notice the air around those two index fingers. And, and what I want you to do is to place your attention on both fingers simultaneously. And because these fingers are sort of 10, 15 centimeters apart, you can't do that by looking directly at your fingers, right? Because you could only look directly at one of them. And so the way to do that is by kind of looking directly between them and th through them so your gaze kind of goes further than your eyes and then you expand your peripheral vision so that you can see both eye as both fingers at the same time yeah so you're gazing at the space in between the two hands kind of relaxing your gaze so that you can expand your peripheral vision. You may even notice with your peripheral vision all the way out to the walls on either side of wherever it is you are if you're in a room. But that you can see pretty clearly these two fingers. Not as clearly as if you were looking directly at them, but you can see the lines on the two fingers. You can see the lines between lines. You can see the way that the light falls on the finger. You can see the fingernail and the translucentness of the nail. 
you can see the different shades, the different colors, the way, way that the light kind of plays on the finger. You can maybe notice your pulse in the finger, the temperature of the finger, temperature of the air around the finger. And if you can just imagine that you were placing a pressure on that finger, which is something similar to if you were going to press on a light switch. So there's a sort of a, there's a vague pointing with intention with that finger on both hands. As if you were just making a little bit of pressure, you were going to press down on a, on a light switch. And so whilst you're doing that, whilst you're noticing what you're noticing, and presumably as you're doing that, your breathing is slowing down and your body is still, and these hands might reach the point where they're almost kind of cataleptic. They are just kind of hovering where they're hovering, but there's no effort involved. It's completely comfortable. And so then, whilst you're observing whatever you're observing, noticing what you're noticing, and maybe even realizing what it is about what you're noticing that is significant, rather than looking at all of the finger, start to look in particular at the, at the front of the two fingers. So you're still keeping your gaze in between the fingers, kind of looking through the gap in between. But you brought your attention to the fingertips. And whenever you're ready, maybe on a in-breath, you put your attention a couple of centimeters in front of both of your fingernails. And just notice what you notice. And don't pay any attention to the screen. Just notice what you notice. Because if you're like me, your mind has gone totally quiet. Your awareness is maybe in your chest, maybe in your stomach, maybe it's nowhere at all. And you've found, you've created a sense of peace inside of yourself, which is incredibly recuperative in itself. So you can use this whenever you choose to do so just to kind of calm yourself down. But the thing is with this state, you can then choose where to shine your torch, where to bring your attention. And you can ask your resources for their help. You can dive into the story of your understanding of what you are. You can ask the question in a way that is meaningful to you, not to me. And you can ask with kind of humility, if it makes sense, for some help. And as I say, if it's useful, you can have your voice recorder going so that you can just speak whenever things come up, or maybe you just want to sit there and notice and observe without any wall between you and what is coming up, without second guessing, well, that'll never work, or that's right, or that's wrong, anything like that. Instead, just inviting, just 
allowing. So that all those little voices that get dominated by the mental voice are able to express, are able to speak, and there can be some magic in what it is that they say. If you're still there, if you're still in that state of peace, enjoying how it feels, just to prove to yourself how easy it is to bring yourself back out, I want you now to just choose, make a decision to open your eyes if they were closed, to take in a deep breath, to shake your arms, to look up at the sky, to do whatever it is that makes sense for you to bring yourself back to a state of full conscious awareness. And do it now so that you can prove to yourself that just through the act of choosing to do so, you're back, you're back. And now what I want you to do is go back into the state of self-hypnosis. So bring your fingers back out, bring your hands back out, what about them hovering above your lap. Focus your attention on those two index fingers. Focus your attention on the air around the fingers. Maybe even noticing what your little fingers are doing. Bring your attention to the warmth, to the temperature of the fingers. Imagine that you're just exercising a little bit of pressure on the tips of the fingers as if you are pressing on a light switch on the wall. Place your gaze in between the two fingers. Allow your gaze to sink between the two fingers. And with your expanded peripheral vision, look at both fingers at the same time. Focus on your breathing. Notice your breathing stilling. Notice how easy it is for your hands to just almost float there. And when you're ready, move your gaze forward from the fingertips to a place a couple of centimeters in front of the fingertips where there's nothing. And notice how good that feels. Notice how quiet that feels. And notice how much like you that feels. And then when you're ready, make the choice again. Good deep breath, shake your hands, open your eyes if they were closed. You know, maybe get up, move around the room, bring yourself back out. If you want, you, you can even kind of mentally count yourself out, you know. I'm going to count out from one to five. When I reach five, I'll be wide awake with full, full awareness. You know, one, feeling absolutely wonderful. Two, to feel like a bird as free as three can be. On four, it's like fresh spring water is bathing my eyelids. And on five, taking in a fantastic deep breath and whoosh, here I am. You know, whatever, you know, whatever makes sense. But the, 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 the point is that the um the, the the way of of waking up the way of coming back up to a state of full awareness is just as much an act of choice as uh, as going in and the whole thing is a metaphor in actual fact what you are simply doing is quietening the chattering part of your mind and permitting the rest of you to express to bring some of that amazing resource yeah so you you capitalize upon your creativity you give it freedom of expression so you can come up with all of the wildness that is there already but that this little bit normally kind of damps down so it's a fantastic tool i hope that's useful yeah you can do it much 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 quicker so the 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 more you practice this the better at it you become the more you practice it, the more you realize the second you begin, oh, we're doing that again. And, and so habitually it becomes easier to do. But you can really get to the point where you are pressing your fingers forwards against an imaginary uh, light switch. You're putting the attention between the eyes. You're putting your attention 
uh, sorry, between the fingers, you put your attention out in front of the fingers and your mind is still. And then you notice your breathing still. And then you notice how still your body is. And then you notice how good it feels. And so on and so forth. Yeah. So they're, they're all away, but, but you can get this down to, honestly, a couple of seconds. Isn't that wild? It's just one amusing way of placing yourself in self-hypnosis. Yeah. And the more that you do it, if you want, if you want to amuse yourself, you can actually go there with an intention that you're going to spend five minutes in that state or three minutes or 10 minutes. And, and just for amusement alone, set a stopwatch next to you that you can't see and just allow yourself to do what feels right and to bring yourself back out at the time that feels right based upon that intention. And you might knock yourself over with a feather when you see how close to the correct time that your intention has begun. It's, it's almost like there is this magical clock inside of us. There we go. I think that'll do for uh, for this episode. Maybe in another episode, I'll I'll show you a couple of ways of examining the conflicts that are going on inside of your mind whilst you're in self-hypnosis. Let's, let's keep that for a, a separate day. All right. Thank you very much for watching. If it's of interest, go have a check out the other videos. They're not all like this. There's a whole variety of different things. Um, I also have podcasts as well, so you can listen to these sort of things, but obviously not the hypnotic ones. And um, well, not in the car anyway. And, uh, and, and thank you for listening. All right. Cheers. Bye.